great games come out every year, and a lot of them go on to do really well. Unfortunately, some of them also don't. Whether it's through bad marketing or a poorly timed release date, whatever the reason, a lot of great games just slip right underneath people's radars. And that's exactly what we're taking a look at today in this brand new segment I like to call the best games you've never played, where we take a look at just that. Great games that for whatever reason just didn't sell very well, most of which you can also find for very cheap used in a game store like GameStop or wherever you get your games. And since it is October, which is Scary Games Month, as you can tell by the lights and the brightness and the nothing dark or scary here at all. But since it's Scary Games Month, I figure what better way to start off both a new segment and Scary Games Month, which I'm getting very tired of saying. What better way to kick both of those off than with a personal favorite game of mine, Alan Wake. So what exactly is Alan Wake? Well, the game makes it easy on us and tells us on its box art. It's a psychological action thriller, which means that it takes a supernatural mystery narrative similar to one found in TV shows like Twin Peaks and mixes it with gameplay that combines survival horror elements with a traditional third-person shooter, kind of like, say, Resident Evil 4. The story centers around the character in question, Alan Wake a famous author from New York City who has just finished up a long series of crime novels by, well, killing off the protagonist. You know, the way everyone ends a story they're getting sick and tired of telling. The complications come when Alan finds that after killing off his protagonist and ending his original series, he can't seem to write, well, anything, really. The game picks up two years later, with the writer's block starting to take a serious toll on his life. His already short temper is getting shorter, he's drinking a lot, and his relationship with his wife Alice is deteriorating. So as a last-ditch attempt to get him writing and try and save their marriage, his wife decides to book them a vacation to scenic Bright Falls, Washington. A nice small little town nestled off in the mountains. Her hope is that the change of scenery would be able to get Alan's creative juices flowing and get him out of the writer's block that he's been stuck in. Of course, this is also where things take a turn for the worse, as the town seems to be a little strange, and on their first night there, Alice simply vanishes. Alan wakes up in a crashed car with a cut on his head and a week of missing time, and that's where the mystery begins. Now, if you heard me run through that and spent the whole time thinking, Oh my god, this sounds interesting. What happens next? For starters, I'm not going to tell you what happens next. Sorry to disappoint. That being said, this game is probably right up your alley as the story manages to stay consistently strong throughout. It answers just enough of your questions to make things feel worthwhile while leaving enough of them unanswered to keep you guessing and keep you thinking and keep you wanting to play. Again, I'm not going to spoil anything as the purpose of this series is still to show you good, cheap games that you should buy and play yourself, not just give you a rundown of the entire story. But the story manages to keep you guessing. It's very interesting and it's got quite a bit more story than most third-person shooters nowadays, so it's certainly a refreshing change of pace. As for how the story is actually told, it's told in a variety of ways, the most obvious being the narration that Alan himself gives. See, the entire game plays out as... not really a flashback. It's kind of hard to explain, really. Almost like a television series, Alan himself is narrating the events the entire time as the game progresses explaining things, elaborating on his feelings around events and characters, things of that nature. And the actual story unfolds in a way similar to any other game, with cutscenes and dialogue and, you know, all that sort of thing. But a lot of smaller aspects of the story are explained through manuscript pages that the player will find, and these are interesting. They're little collectibles scattered throughout the levels, which essentially serve to fill in the plot. They're, they're very rarely essential, so if you go through the game and just somehow don't manage to find hardly any of them at all, you're not going to be left totally lost or confused. But 
they definitely add a lot to the experience. And again, they're entirely optional. You can finish the game feeling extremely satisfied, having only found the ones that the game very clearly intends for you to find. But they really make it worth checking out the little side areas that you can explore throughout the main game. The really interesting thing about these manuscript pages is that some of them will actually warn you about events that have yet to happen in the game. Once again, I'm not going to go into too much detail about how that makes sense in the narrative, as once again, I don't want to spoil anything for those of you that haven't played the game. But it's explained. It, it makes sense. I know it sounds crazy when I'm saying it, but you'll, under, you'll understand how it works. And I really like that idea of being able to find a collectible that'll potentially warn you of, say, a, a difficult encounter that is coming up later on in the level so that you can prepare for that. You can save ammunition for your big weapons and stockpile things like grenades and flares so that you have access to them later when you need them. The manuscript pages are very cool. I like that a lot about this game. In fact, it's one of my favorite parts about the narrative because it allows you to kind of piece things together and the fact that they all add to the story but you're certainly not going to find them all in one playthrough means that it allows for ex some extremely open interpretations of the story. It's very clever. It's very cool. But the story's not going to mean a whole lot without fun gameplay to back it up. Thankfully, Alan Wake manages to deliver on that as well. The core gameplay is more or less that of your typical third-person shooter with some survival horror elements thrown in. Your main weapon is your flashlight, which you use against shadowy enemies known as the Taken, which are human beings who have been possessed by the dark force at the heart of the game's story. Now these enemies are protected by the darkness itself. It kind of moves around them in a sh sort of shield that makes them invulnerable to damage. The only way you can get through this shield is to shine your light at them, which burns the darkness away, eventually destroying it and making them vulnerable to damage by traditional means, like firearms. This is a cool mechanic, and I like it a lot. It adds a little bit of a clever mechanic to the game, in that you often have to judge your threats early on in a fight to determine which enemies you need to focus on first, as you can't just hammer away at the closest ones to you. You have to drain the darkness around them first, otherwise you can't damage them. It can create a bit of tension, as you'll often have to choose between focusing on smaller, weaker, but closer enemies, or going on ahead and whittling down a huge, tough monster a little further down from you. It's nothing terribly strategic or anything, but it still adds a nice little layer of thought to the combat that otherwise wouldn't be there, especially given that, for the most part, the gameplay is otherwise fairly simplistic. You've got a decent arsenal of traditional firearms, revolvers, hunting rifles, shotguns, and the like, but none of it's really terribly creative or all that interesting. And really, save for extremely difficult enemies, there's not a whole lot of reason to use anything beyond the default revolver, which does plenty fine against most opponents. There are other enemies beyond the standard taken, however, mostly in the form of things called poltergeist objects, which are essentially inanimate objects which have been possessed by this darkness and are now literally being thrown at you. It's a clever idea, and the first few times it happens, it's pretty tense, but personally, I didn't care for these segments all that much. You can't damage them through normal means. Instead, after you shine your light on them long enough, they just kind of vanish on their own. It doesn't take a whole lot to bring them down, but if there are multiples of them on screen at one time, it won't be terribly uncommon for your flashlight to run out of battery when you're in the middle of dealing with one, only for you to turn around and get hit while you're changing the batteries in your flashlight. Again, they're a clever idea, and they add a little bit of variety to the combat, but I didn't personally care for them that much. Aside from that, there's the typical scavenging mechanic that one would expect in a horror game such as this. Ammunition is rarely so scarce that you find yourself completely out of bullets, but is also rarely abundant enough that you're going to hit max ammo on everything. Save for maybe your revolver, 
which I found the ammo to be a, a, maybe a bit too abundant for at times, though I'm not really complaining. You'll also be able to find things like flares, which can be used to push enemies back as they will avoid the light emanating from them, or flashbangs, which are a sort of ace-in-the-hole type weapon. They can be used as a last resort if you find yourself surrounded by more enemies than you can deal with. You drop it, and the bright flash of light destroys most enemies in one single attack. You'll also have to scavenge batteries for your flashlight, but these are, much like revolver ammo, usually plentiful enough that you'll, you'll at least have a few in backup in case your flashlight starts running a little low on juice. Ammunition and batteries can be found pretty much anywhere in levels, in the backs of abandoned vehicles and crates in people's houses, but you can also find these little these little pathways that are marked with invisible paint that is illuminated by your flashlight. Story-wise, these factor into the plot near the end of the game, but from a gameplay perspective, they usually lead the player to a pretty substantial stash of ammunition and supplies. Aside from the glowing paint, which will be, again, lit up by your flashlight, you can usually tell one is close by because you'll start to hear heavy breathing in the background, which, again, just adds to the atmosphere, which, might I add, is something this game does very well. The game is very atmospheric, especially during the levels that take place in the woods at night, which, admittedly, is most levels. The level design is excellent, and it's all bolstered by some gorgeous graphics. The forests really look amazing. They look dark, they look ominous. It looks threatening when you're out in these woods, and the sound design is top-notch. Twigs will snap, you'll hear the footsteps of enemies running in the distance that you can't quite see, and you'll hear that whooshing of the wind through the trees whenever enemies start to get near. I hate that noise. I really hate that noise. That noise makes me tense every time. Just, just listen to it. That noise is pretty creepy, and it always gets me freaked out every time I hear it. And really, that noise is a testament to how good the production values for the game are, at least as far as sound quality goes. In fact, the sound design for this game is amazing. It's some of the best sound design I've ever heard. It really pulls you into the game and helps to build a lot of immersion. It's very well done. The visuals are also good, but they're not as good as the sound design. On a large scale, they're great. The environments are absolutely gorgeous. But viewed up close, things aren't always as good, especially when it comes to the character models, and more specifically when it comes to characters' faces. If there's one thing the game doesn't really do very well, it's facial animations, and that's probably the biggest issue I have with this game. The facial animations aren't very good. They're not very good in gameplay, and they're not very good in cutscenes. And it, it can be a little immersion-breaking at times. It can definitely pull you out of the story sometimes when you see a character with just terrible lip syncing or just an awkwardly inhumanly modeled face. And Alan's wife, Alice, is actually probably the biggest defender in this game. Something about th her character model is just... It's, it's, it's not natural. It's not normal. She's, she's as terrifying to look at as any of the monsters in the game. The facial animations are, are far and away the weakest part of this game. That being said, if you can get past them, they're not game-breaking, but it's hard not to notice at times. Still, the game overall looks pretty good, especially the lighting system, which is very impressive. The lighting is, is absolutely top-notch, and that's part of what helps the game build such a great atmosphere. Dark environments are dark and you really feel like your flashlight is the only thing that's really guiding you through. And once again, what the game occasionally lacks in visual quality, it more than makes up for in its excellent sound design. The game is, is still ultimately a very well-made game, lip-sync issues aside. It looks good, and it sounds great.
And that's more or less Alan Wake, an excellent game from about four and a half years ago that you can find for fairly cheap at most game retailers. I think it runs under $15 at most places right now. And should you pick it up? Absolutely. It's got an excellent atmosphere and a fantastic story, so gamers looking for a bit more thoughtful of a third-person shooter should feel right at home here. That being said, the actual third-person shooter part of the game isn't quite as good. It's certainly not bad by any means, but it's not really anything special either. So if you're not really all that interested in story and are just looking for a third-person shooter, it, it might still be worth picking up if you can find it cheap, but there are better games to satisfy that need for you out there. But again, if you're in the market for a thoughtful game with a, a good story and excellent atmosphere, Alan Wake is absolutely a game that you should consider picking up. It's a great game, and given that it's over four years old, you can find it pretty cheaply at most stores. And that's basically Alan Wake in a nutshell. What did you guys think? As always, let me know in the comments below. Uh, if you have any other great underrated games you'd like for me to talk about in a future episode of the best games you've never played, also let me know in the comments below. And if I talk about your suggestion, I will be sure to give you a shout out in the next video. That's pretty much it, guys. I'm Aladman98, and as always, thanks for watching. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a review to do. Cannot wait to play you. I cannot wait to play this.